Now welcome uh, Amit Sinha, Nathan Howe, and Davil Sherman to the stage, please. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Indeed, afternoon. So um, welcome, everybody. This is going to be, uh, I think, pretty clearly a uh, question and answer session. Um, gentlemen here will certainly be able to answer most of your technical questions, if you have any. Um, but also, we can make this a bit interactive as well. This is not just about uh, how things work or what they work and how, what we, whatever we'd need to hear from the brains we have here as well. So I'll ask, beginning uh, to the, the room, is there any questions you'd like to begin with around zero trust? Or I will also just start asking the gentleman questions as well. I'm sure I'm not going to be the only one. Okay, last chance. All right, so let me, the question to you guys. Um, Jay just ended around, around talking around segmentation. Um, Customers tend to struggle with the idea of segmentation being a thing to begin with. Where do they start? Is it users? Is it workloads? In your experience, and especially as what we're pro providing the platform now, what do you think is a, a good way for customers to start segmentation in a very effective way to get the most value out of the, the zero trust direction? I can start. Um, you know, the topic of segmentation comes up. I think Jay has used a very effective analogy, which uh, some of you might have heard. You know, in the world of segmentation, there is kindergarten, there is middle school, there's high school, and there's PhD, right? Most people start getting obsessed with, I want to do process to process, full identity based segmentation across everything, where they haven't even gone through, you know, elementary and middle school, right? What is that? Um, step one should be user to workload segmentation. Right. An example I was giving uh, earlier was, uh, you know, you have, say, an Alexa device at home and you want to access it over your iPhone. You don't start by saying, I'm going to connect my home network to every other home network in the world and then I will access that. Right. So how do I do step one? My users talking to my internal applications, are they segmented based on policy? Once I've done that, then you go to step two, which is more macro segmentation, right? Uh, are my workloads in a VPC talking to a data center segmented, right? Are VPCs, uh, are workloads in one VPC to another VPC segmented, right? So that's kind of the step-by-step the -step model. And at every step, you reduce the attack surface dramatically, uh, make things easier to interconnect and operate. Uh, and that should, and then finally, if you really are into it, you've gone through all of that and you want to do PhD in, in segmentation, you get to do real, real micro segmentation within a VPC. Process level segmentation is also possible, and we do that. Uh, but you know, that's that's step three. In my opinion, I'll, I'll add one more thing to that. Uh, especially when you are thinking of adopting a zero trust platform, and you're thinking of retiring your VPNs, right? A lot of time, uh, people come to us and say, "I want to start with a segmentation policy." We tell them. You can replace your VPN without creating a segmentation policy. In your VPN world, you're opening your network to everything. So just deploy ZPA in a way or a zero trust architecture in a way that you still do a start or start policy in which your employees can connect to the application they were connecting to. There's no disruption, but you go behind this zero trust architecture. All, a lot of your private applications go dark, right? And then you start building your segmentation policy, starting with your crown drill and then start segmenting it. So don't look for a big bang uh, segmentation policy on day one. Start by doing start as star and then start focusing on what are real crown jewel applications for you. It's an interesting point, and I'm going to ask a question to the audience um, because Dal talks about crown jewel applications. And that obviously implies there's a knowledge about what applications we do have, what workloads we have. Show of hands of those of you who have an accurate, up to date inventory of all of your applications to segment out. That's one. impressive. That's great. Congratulations. Well done. No, seriously, that is amazing. Ah, that's my next question. How did you do that? Um, <laughs> okay, so we started about two years ago, and when we opened up Zscaler for remote access, it was basically with a wild card. So basically, okay. we're teaching it, we're telling it, just like a VPN, you have access to everything. Then we let Zscaler start to learn, yeah. learn all, all of our applications. We came up with a list. We went to our application developers. We went to our business units and said, are all these your applications? Who needs to access them? Then we started creating these segments. We started you know, creating the application policies so that users can start accessing. So right now, it took us about 
probably about not nine months to kind of really fine tune it because um, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't know, know yeah. about and yeah. a lot of stuff we didn't want to do anymore. So what we did was we took out that wild card at one day and we said, we, we you know, we let our, um, you know, upper management know, you know, we might have a screen test out there. Hmm. Luckily there, there wasn't. So we did all of our work ahead of time, got everything set, segmented out application wise. And it was it was a long process, but you have to take it very very slowly. You have to kind of under, under, understand what your applications are, and then everything that goes through Zscaler, both for a remote workforce coming in and our internal network, our internal users as well, um, they log into they have to log into Zscaler in order to get the applications internally as well, because we use the, pri the private ser service edge as well. That's awesome. Yeah. One quick comment I'd add, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, fascinating that you were able to, you know, get a list of all your applications, put them into good policy buckets. Uh, tomorrow, and this is just an early preview, we'll announce how you can use our um, AI ML recommendation engine that will essentially read your ZPA logs with a star dot star policy and then start grouping applications and give you policy recommendations. So much of the manual work that you did in nine months, we want to automate and make it easier for you. Uh, you run the, you run ZPA with a star dot star access policy, and then it can start seeing, well, this looks like, uh, this looks like SAP, right? These group of internal assets. And this is a group of finance users. So let me recommend a policy for that. This looks like um, um, engineering jump host. And here are some DevOps users that are using it. So what are some high impact segmentation policies that we can um, auto recommend using machine learning grouping and uh, really cut down your internal attack surface? Yeah. So that's our goal because we've frequently seen big organizations with 50,000 internal apps, right? How are you even going to start putting your arms around it? Sure thing. Um, once you take out that wild card, um, make sure your application developers or system integrators know that they need to let you know when they want to deploy a new application. Yeah. yeah. Because that's really, really important because moving forward, you know, they, we have a couple of segments that don't need to have access through, through Zscaler for application development and the applications work, yeah. but then they want to put it in production and they don't work and they, yeah. and they're scratching their heads. So it's really, really important to let, uh, your application developers know that they have to let you know the URLs and what and who needs access to what applications so you can define them in, Z, in Zscaler. Absolutely. I, I think I should probably just, congratulations, that's, that's <laughs> well done, seriously. No, no, jokes aside, it's one of the biggest challenges most enterprises will face is getting that inventory, keeping it up to date and understanding it. And it's great to hear an example of that. And one more thing to remember, like early days of ZPA when you're asking customers, like how many applications you have in your network that you want to protect with ZPA? They will say 100, and by the time the discovery that you're talking about that ends, there were 500 applications. So there were always four to five x more applications they anticipated were there, because some developer 20 years ago set up a server that's still there. No one is patching it, but we once you start discovering it, then you can start defining segments around it. We call it internal shadow IT. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. hairier and messier than <laughs> SaaS shadow IT. Absolutely. So before I ask my next question, is there any questions from the audience before I? This is a, your, your question and answer session with the gentleman here. If not, I'll ask this one. We've talked a lot about zero trust as a company. That's what we are very much focused on, but it's not a product. Can you give us some more insight as to what, the, what really is zero trust in terms of a business value, not technology, but the business value we see and what it drives for our customers? I'll give you a short answer. We have an awesome book that we just released. <laughs> you should read it on your way back and uh, it will be, there you go, he yeah. has it. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, maybe that'd be my answer, <laughs> but look, if I have to digest it down, we talked about it a few times. Um, fundamentally, you know, zero trust, uh, starts with identity, right? You have to know who the, who is on the other side, but then as you start getting into the architecture, the first thing that we do is we decouple applications from users or users could be workloads, right? Uh, you don't need to have a user or a workload that needs to talk to a destination on the same network, right? When you access Gmail on your iPhone, you don't VPN from your phone to Google's network. Google won't even allow you to do that. Unfortunately, all of you let your users do that for your internal applications, right? 
So decouple applications from the from uh, from uh, uh, the users, right, or from the network. Second thing is minimizing the attack surface, right. Uh, if you've adopted Zscaler completely, ZIA and ZPA, hopefully the only thing that's exposed is your public internet domain, right? www.company.com. Uh, that's a massive attack surface reduction. What cannot be discovered from the internet, you know, cannot be attacked. Many people, uh, when we had Log4j, they came back and said, hey, uh, you know, do I need to worry about it? Well, you do need to, but it's not a burning fire right now because it's not even exposed and so it's not exploitable. Uh, so minimizing attack surface becomes uh, the, sec the second thing that we do. And the third is, you know, you can't have um, um, zero trust without a full proxy-based architecture that is, uh, that is, you know, st stopping the connection, looking at who you are, looking at, uh, looking at where you want to go to, uh, looking at the content that you are carrying, making a dynamic assessment of risk, based on your posture, your identity, your content, uh, the destination where you're heading to. And based on all of that, allowing you to go or, no, or not go or maybe quarantining you or putting you in an isolation. So these are things that you have to do every transaction. It's not like once I authenticate you, you are free to do whatever you want. So that requires a proxy-based uh, architecture that is intercepting SSL, looking at who you are and looking at the entire context of that transaction. And that's what we do. We do that 250 billion times a day. And it requires a lot of, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure and engineering and proper architecture. So um, that's how we look at zero trust. There's a lot of uh, buzzwords around zero trust, uh, but fundamentally you don't trust anything or anyone and you do those checks every time. And one more thing to just layer on in that is, Amit said it starts with identity, right? Identity is also evolving. It's not just a user and who the user is. There is rich context around a user identity these days, which could be the device or location, or it could be what kind of device users uses or their uh, like history. We are all sitting here in Vegas right now. And if my cloud starts seeing, my, our cloud starts seeing my traffic coming from uh, like in Europe at this point. So it is anomalous behavior. That all becomes context. A lot of access should be tied to that. and. As you think about uh, the question that Nathan asked, like how, how beyond technology, it, in my opinion, it also leads to a bigger set of cost savings because once you start decoupling the network from all your uh, identity-based access, a lot of investments that you do in uh, point-in-time uh, tools like NAC, for example, are not required anymore because you're not connecting to that network. So it does lead to consolidation and uh, cost savings from a organization perspective as well. And maybe I'll add a little comment from uh, one of our customers who made a comment in one of our recent EBCs. The comment was that security signed off on Zero Trust. The goal of Zero Trust is clear in the sign off on that. So she's the CIO and she sees this, that Zero Trust as an enabler to transform the organization, to rethink the way in which business is done. And that has many implications, not just on things like uh, the type of infrastructure, the network and so forth, but the entirety of the business. How do they change the way in which things are accessed across the business um, and who gets access? So it becomes a, a much more of a, of a business enabler when you can step back from the IT thing, because obviously like, from technology, it enables. When you step back and look at what that can drive from the business, it's actually quite interesting. Question in the back. Are we on? Yeah, hey. Um, so a disclaimer, I am on Zscale, I'm on the transformation team, but I recently came over as a customer. Um, I use Zero Trust as a business enabler around the aspect of flexibility. For us, it was all about cloud. We are a big global company. We couldn't do it backhauling everything. But with uh, the ZIA and ZEPA together, we are able to start using cloud which in turn enabled that business flexibility for us. We could start doing innovative things that we couldn't do on-prem, we just couldn't afford to. But when they had to scale up and scale down uh, capabilities of the cloud, that was a true business enabler for mm. us. That's fantastic. And I think to elaborate on that to the next question is what becomes, we've all, everyone so far has talked about IT. I'm gonna shift gears and talk about the other side of the equation, OT. Um, we see a lot of that, obviously, with uh, the, the Jay mentioned in, in the keynote today around, around the pipeline attacks and others we're seeing. Obviously, Zero Trust is an enabler for these areas, but it's a different identity. Yeah. It's a different mechanism, a different way of thinking. Can you elaborate more on where we see from a company o OT becoming a play? Yeah. So, look, uh, the state of OT is two decades behind the state of IT, typically what we see. 
And uh, uh, the most sophisticated form of identity we see in OT world is a X509 certificate, right? Which we have got rid in the IT world for a long time. But that's like state of the art. The, mm -hmm. Most of them are still with a, a static token-based password that might be shared with five different contractors logging into the same system with the same password. So uh, what we are, what we have been able to do, and this is why when we think about zero trust network access or ZTNA, we look at it as uh, something which we have, uh, our customers have been using it to get their users and their applications safe. It could be extended more as a universal zero trust network access, cover, uh, also covering your OT assets as well. And the intent there is pretty simple. You want to make sure your OT assets, when they go to the internet, they are secure. And if some, uh, on OT especially, when someone is trying to get into those devices, especially for remote hands, maintenance, they could be at a site where the connectivity is not good. You want to make sure that the underlay network becomes irrelevant and you get a strong overlay zero trust architecture. So that's the basic genesis, but Amit can give you a little bit more insight onto it. Yeah, uh, two, two comments I'd add. One, um, OT identity is problematic, right? <laughs> uh, one of the things that we are doing is, uh, again, using a lot of machine learning on all the traffic that is going through us to be able to, to identify this is a MRI machine, this is a Roku device attached to a TV in a conference room. And here's a, you know, we've looked at Alex's uh, NOV logs and you know, all <laughs> kinds of IoT devices pop up. Uh, but we have a pretty sophisticated machine learning team that is uh, their sole job is to analyze transaction logs and classify uh, IoT devices into categories and specific devices, right? So even if you don't have a specific identity, you can at least start crafting policies that says, okay, it's in a higher level of security for MRI machines, lower level of security for Apple TVs that are sc scattered everywhere, right? So that's number one. The second thing I would say is zero trust is far more important for your OT environments than it is for IT. Why is that? Number one, your OT environments are business critical. They are the ones that, you know, that's, that's driving your business overall. Number two, they, they, they don't get patched. They are, you know, they are much more vulnerable, right? Uh, it could be engines, it could be late machines, it could be MRI, it could be all kinds of things. And nobody touches software on it because nobody wants to break it. So you might have business critical machines running software that hasn't been patched in a decade, right? Uh, Imagine now you have a VPN network and you're, you know, you're just exposing all of that to third party contractors and maintenance crews or other folks that just want telemetry data from it, right? So zero trust, even more important, right? For OT environments and OT environments are difficult given some of the identity challenges and the fact that, you know, uh, it's more exploitable. So looking at all of that, uh, you know, we have, we are extending ZPA to OT and IoT environments where um, you know, Jay talked about Siemens, you know, you might have an engine and, you know, third party contractor needs to log in and, and maintain it. Should I give them access to the full network? No, right? That was the whole target breach. The HVAC contractors needed some building maintenance system. The only way to expose that was to give them a VPN like access. Really what you should have done is just exposed that particular asset to that particular contractor. And that's, that's again and again, what we go back to business policies, the right user having access to the right application. And can you do that in a frictionless way? That's what we do. So oh, we have questions. Third reason now. One second. They have cyber physical systems and therefore the cost of an attack on an OT system could be much massive. Yeah, it yeah. could lead to disasters and so yep. on and so forth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Other questions from the yeah. audience? Gentlemen there. So uh, you mentioned cost just a minute ago. Cost takeout is a conversation that's kicking back up again in security IT space. When you move to these technologies, what are the big buckets that you can pull out? Yeah, I'll start. The biggest bucket you pull out, step one, is you eliminate the network, right? Uh, I think Alex talked about it as stage one or two in their journey. Just the the, the cost of having an MPLS back backhaul, connecting all of these uh, branches and offices and taking traffic from users 
that was ultimately destined to go to the internet, right? And through COVID, we've seen the internet is a damn good network. And if most of my center of gravity is on the internet, I don't need to carry that traffic on my expensive circuits, right? So the first thing you eliminate is, is huge MPLS costs. Now, how is that quantified? I think we have a public case study from Siemens, 400,000 employees, their infrastructure cost reduction, largely all the you know, simplification in the network was 70%, right? So that's the kind of cost you eliminate uh, just by, and you can imagine what that is for a 400,000 person global organization. So no network, right, to manage, that's a great thing. Uh, the second thing is, you know, there's a lot of operational costs, right? If you have too many different point products, mm -hmm. you know, there's alert fatigue, you're chasing, you know, different consoles, you know, your security risk is not going down, but your operational cost of running a SOC and, 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 and people and, and policies in different uh, consoles is, is, is also very high. So you, that's the second thing you eliminate, a lot of operational overhead of managing individual point products. Um, and then, you know, there are other benefits as you start getting into things like Zscaler digital experience, right? So the, the cost of, I mean, look at it from an IT perspective. Your employees are everywhere, workloads are everywhere. The, co the, the cost of troubleshooting user experience issues is, 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 is a lot, right? How can we make it frictionless, easy, uh, you know, more self-service driven? Uh, you know, you don't need to have an IT person call someone every time there's a problem with Teams or Zoom. That's a huge cost too, right? Like, you know, delivering good user experience to your employees. So those are kind of the you know, typical buckets that I would look at. Now, if you start looking at it from an overall TCO ROI perspective, I would argue that, you know, if user experience is poor and you're, you're, there's latency and there's problems and your employees are spending too much time on VPNs and connectivity issues, business is suffering too, right? So they're delivering those kind of, you know, better user experience, frictionless uh, results in overall, you know, ROI uh, as well. If with ZISGPA, you're no longer rerouting traffic through the data center, think of the number of boxes you keep on upgrading in your data center all the time because it just funneled through it. The more traffic flows through your data center, the bigger routers, bigger switches, bigger firewall, bigger load balancer, bigger everything you have. All of you generally agree that data center is becoming less and less important. More and more applications are moving out either to SaaS or to public cloud like AWS and Azure. If data center becomes only 50% of your applications, why should you have to upgrade any router, any switch, any firewall in the data center? You shouldn't. You only upgrade because you're still routing the traffic through, which is creating slowness and cost. So think about it. That's why only traffic that's headed to the data center should go there. If that's the case, think of the amount of savings you have. The cost is not of a router in a branch office that's cheap. Those mega routers that handle 50 or 100 gigs, they are very expensive. That's very tangible savings. Yep. Did it make sense? Yeah. That's, that's the wave is coming more and more. I think I'll add a comment on that actually from a customer that, that explained it to us and they, they took metrics of all of their infrastructure during the COVID period. And they said, well, actually we have all this infrastructure that's sitting there and it's just spinning to Jay's point. We have electricity running, running, no one's in that office and they called the dust test. How much dust was sitting on that infrastructure? And they would, they drew a limit and said, if there's this much dust, we don't need it anymore. And to, <laughs> to Jay's point, just cut it out. We don't need that anymore because there's nobody there anymore. Everyone's working remotely. And that, that sort of allows you to start thinking about, and, and maybe it's a question for you guys to think about is, go back and think, well, hold on, how much of this has actually been used in the last two years? And do we really need it? And do we need to pump it through to Jay's point through the data center? And if you don't, then there's an order, before you even begin the process with us or any of the solutions, there's a savings right there for you. All right, we have a few minutes. Question, yeah. Just a quick question, um, I'll speak up. Uh, from a CFO standpoint, some of the companies that you guys are working with, large enterprises, mm. what kind of response are you getting from CFOs? It, how often are they involved in the conversation and when? Oh. <laughs> I deal with that a lot. So maybe I can help. The, the bigger the deal, 
mm. the more likely CF involvement as you would expect, right? So if you got a sizable deal, I think you should do something what we offer called business value assessment. We have a team of people who can actually tell you what can be taken out over what period of time. Your contracts or everything aren't getting uh, finished, terminated overnight. And the technology you're not going to uh, roll out overnight. You can work with us as true partners. You can show us, we can take a look and say, these, the rollout can be done in a phased fashion in Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 type of stuff. These pieces can be rolled out. If you really do that real, real assessment, ROI becomes very compelling and CFO likes it. One of the things you'll have to proactively do is generally prod your teams to really take things out. You think buying things is hard, taking things out is harder. The emotional ties, people have done it. There may be 10 reasons to take something out. They find one reason to keep it, okay. mm -hmm. right? So if you really do so, this technology actually saves money. <clears throat> really saves money because there's so many pieces that are not needed anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one more thing to add to that, like as we've been engaging with more and more procurement teams, which are part of the finance organization, one thing we see is that discussions are not more about like how much, how cheap you are, right? Your solution is like, it's more about what are the benefit metrics? So that they are more interested in benefits. What are the business outcomes they can achieve instead of just looking at it as a cost. So we are seeing more and more shift in that direction as well. Right. As we converted away from MPLS networks, the device that they didn't want to get rid of, believe it or not, were packet liars. I mean, packet shapers, uh, <laughs> packet <li> like your <laughs> riverbeds, <laughs> right? And packet so packet I finally just had to say, get rid of them. They caused, I mean, we had more outages from those devices failing than any benefit. And, you know, when you go from a 1.5 megabit MPLS circuit to a 20 or 200 meg internet circuit, Nobody why do you cares. need those devices? Mm. So Fully agree. We have five minutes before we need to master the next next group. So there's uh, this is your opportunity to ask any last minute questions to the gentleman here. I, I don't want to be the one asking all the questions. Give it a few seconds. Well, let me ask the audience this, and then maybe they can challenge you. For those of you who have begun this zero trust journey, what's been the biggest challenge, and how can they help you? Any feedback that you want to share with your peers? Very quiet group today. All right. So then let me spin it. Um, we've obviously been involved with a lot of big deployments to our customers. Where do we see the biggest challenges in getting things moving to get to that value realization for our customers? Perhaps it's the last thing we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. I'd say the biggest challenge is always uh, the inertia for change. So, uh, you know, we talk about the OSI network stack, right? You know, physical layer to the to the application layer, there are three other layers above it, right? There's <laughs> politics, religion, and other things. So we, you know, we 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 see when when change is driven from the top with clarity and purpose, things happen. Uh, if if not, then you know there is more friction in the process. So I'd say uh, inertia to change has been probably the the, the biggest uh, biggest bump. Uh, but once you once you're past it and you start seeing the benefits, uh, things generally move fast. Yeah, I, and working very closely with our deployment teams and architects, so a couple of things that I've noticed is deployments that go really well were, are the ones where there are teams and people uh, who are assigned and you know who own the delivery of the project and there is a proper architecture workshop and there's a proper deployment architecture prepared, right? And you our goal is to assign a project manager. There should be a project manager on your side. They work together and you come up with milestone based uh, outcomes. And that's the ones we see progressing well. So it needs time and investment initially, mm -hmm. but you reap benefits over a longer period of time. So it becomes operational uh, for you over a longer period of time as well. Dan. Hey guys, I, I can add one thing to this. So um, my name is Dan Shelton. I'm on the transformation strategy team at Zscaler, but I also was a customer and I deployed ZIA and ZPA in a large global organization to hit on what Amit and Davo just said, the, the biggest challenge I had was my teams understanding what their role would be in the future. 
So we had to sit down and, and execute on the architecture workshop. We had to execute on the business case, but we also had to sit and have courageous conversation with the different team members on what would be their role in this new world where you're not managing the underlying infrastructure of all of the boxes and appliances to deliver services to your business. Because before, before I did that, there was always one reason to keep things on-prem and to keep that kind of management function in place. And as soon as people understood what their role would be in the future, and it wasn't a conversation about reducing resources, it was a conversation about, hey, what could we do better for our business that we're not doing today? Then all of a sudden, everybody got on board mm -hmm. with the programs. And Jay, you had a slide that um, in the, the session before that talked about being a business strategist as opposed to somebody that is managing a proxy or a firewall or a data center switch or router. And we really challenged every person on our team to move to that kind of mindset and had them aligned to different business units and understanding and helping our business like understand what their processes would, could be and how we could optimize them. But it, but it was a huge challenge to get people in that mindset. I'm talking months, but it was a, a push on the leadership team. And once we did that, we started to get incredible traction and momentum in the project. Wow. Well, if there's nothing final now, you can always catch us around running around, of course. Um, I think it's time to wind up. So I'd like to thank, thank Amit and, and Double for the time and thank you all for your questions and feedback. Great to hear about the one inventory that's accurate. It's wonderful to see. <laughs> we should all aspire to, to, to be the same. Congratulations. Um, so thank you all and we'll, we'll see you later. Well, thank we'll you. make it available for everyone. So yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you.